Hello, everyone, and welcome to At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Mike Worth, CEO of Chevron. Mike, great to see you. Andy, it's good to be here. So the price of oil has gone up a lot recently over the summer, say from the high 60s earlier this year at about 90 bucks. Where is it headed now, Mike, and why is that the case? Well, one of the things you learn in our business is uh, it's very difficult to predict oil prices. And we don't actually plan our business around an oil price. We look at a range of them. Uh, what's going on right now is we've got a global economy that's pretty healthy. It's growing, uh, even in China, although maybe a little bit slower. And the real issue is on the supply side. So the three biggest producers in the world, Russia, the United States, and Saudi Arabia, for one reason or another, have some questions about their ability to continue to grow their production. So markets are tight, inventories are coming down, and there's a perception that supply may be more difficult, uh, incremental supply, to come into the market. And so I think you're seeing prices reflect that. And so is there a natural equilibrium maybe ever, or at least given the economy today, where you think that price would make sense? It's been a while since we've seen what you might call a market in equilibrium. If you go back to 2020 with COVID and uh, demand collapsing and prices doing the same, recovery uh, subsequently with vaccines and economies opening up, then we have the war in Ukraine. Uh, so it's been a while since we've had what I would call market conditions that even could give you a chance at equilibrium. Uh, if you go back before that, we, we saw prices in the um, kind of 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s, which I think most people, you look at investors, that tends to be a price that they look at and say, this is what we can plan around. And so prices today are certainly a little bit north of that. Right. You guys are what is called an integrated oil company. And I'm curious about money making, where that takes place in the company. Is it mostly upstream? in terms of refining and selling oil and gas, or is it more downstream, midstream, in terms of finished products and selling those? Talk to us about your, your mix of business. We tend to have a larger position in the upstream, so exploration and production, than we do in the, the midstream, which is transportation and, and, and trading, or downstream, which is refining and then marketing the many products that come out of a, a barrel of oil. So our company makes more money in the upstream, uh, market conditions can, you know, cycle, and, and there are times when they tend to favor downstream. We've seen really strong refining margins this year, and uh, and upstream prices have been okay. But I'd say downstream has been more profitable for for a good part of this year than upstream. But the reverse can happen in the next, you know, few months. And so, uh, having an integrated portfolio gives you a bit of a natural hedge across that entire value chain. Is Chevron less of an integrated company than it used to be? Is there a trend to sort of focus more, for instance, not going after um, areas that are really, really difficult to produce oil from? Well, typically when people talk about integration, it's do you have an upstream company or a downstream yeah. company? There's, there's a f only a few left that have, right. have both. Uh, we intend to stay with both. I would argue we're becoming more integrated, particularly as we're getting into some of the new energy products like mm. hydrogen or renewable fuels. Uh, which build off of our strengths and kind of unique capabilities, which we can integrate into new products, new technologies, and new markets. Yeah, we're going to talk about some of that in a second. But I want to ask you about the Permian Basin, which has been an area of focus for you guys. Southwestern Texas, a little bit of New Mexico. Is it surprising that going after going all over the world for oil and gas, that maybe the best resource is right here in the United States? Does that match actually what's going on around the world in terms of staying here in the USA and that being the best strategy? The interesting thing is we've always known about the shales in the Permian. We've drilled through these rocks for decades to get to reserves that were easier to produce in, in deeper formations. Uh, the shale is very hard. It's very tight and uh, molecules don't flow through it the way they would flow through a, a sandstone, which tends to think about sand and it's, it's got more pore space, more uh, void space for molecules to flow through. This shale is very, very tight. Uh, what really changed is the ability now to drill horizontally. And so we can take a, a drill bit and bring it down into the earth two miles, then we can turn it and we can run it another two or three miles in a space that's no thicker than, than a, kind of the height of a normal room and keep the drill bit in there. So expose the well bore to three miles now uh, as opposed to 15 or 20 feet of the, the formation that you want to be exposed to. And then we can use uh, essentially pressure and sand 
to create small cracks in that rock, which allows molecules to flow through it. So the technology and really the combination of horizontal drilling and this hydraulic fracturing technology allowed a, a, a resource that was always understood to be there to now be produced in a way that's economic. And so not surprising to us, uh, the U.S. has a, a, a very strong geologic history relative to much of the rest of the world, which is the key in our business is the, is the geology of the planet. Some of that reminds me that you studied chemical engineering in school, right? I um, did. Want to sort of spin around the globe at some of your other resources. Australia, you've got that big liquid natural gas facility, facilities in Western Australia near Barrow Island. Mm -hmm. There have been some labor issues there. What's the latest going on there? We've got negotiations underway with, uh, with the represented workforce, about 500 employees at three different uh, operating uh, locations in Western Australia. Uh, other uh, operators that are in similar businesses to us have had similar negotiations and concluded those. Uh, we're confident that, uh, that we'll reach an agreement with the workforce. In the meantime, they're taking certain protected industrial actions, which is what they're called, kind of strike, uh, if you were talking about it in the U.S. context, uh, of short or you know, kind of increasing duration. Uh, we have to prepare a non-represented workforce to operate the facility when uh, our, our workforce that are represented by the union step away from their jobs. We're doing that. Operations have continued uh, undisturbed. Uh, the flow of energy into the world is undisturbed, and, uh, and, and we expect that will continue. Uh, we're, we're seeking a resolution to this, and I, I'm, I'm sure we'll achieve that. About 5% of the world's LNG supply comes from that place? These are two very large and important facilities in the, in the global LNG market, which is why we're so committed to ensuring that they stay in service. I want to ask you about Kazakhstan, which may surprise people to know that you have a, a presence there as well. How stable is that country and how, do you, how sanguine are you about it? it it's been a success story in the post-Soviet uh, era. Uh, it was one of the first uh, republics to lay down its nuclear weapons uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, to diversify its economy, to bring in uh, investors uh, from the outside. And, and I think like many young countries, it's gone through uh, some ups and downs, but uh, we've had a very a good relationship with the republic uh, with, through, through multiple generations of, of leadership now and uh, have been a big part of uh, the economy uh, evolving and growing. Uh, we're the largest foreign investor in Kazakhstan and, um, and, and provide a lot of energy out of that country into Europe, which is very important today. And, uh, and it remains a, a really important part of our portfolio. So uh, a, a success story. Maybe we'll segue into Europe then. And how sanguine are you about energy supplies to Europe this winter? And is it possible that some of your Mediterranean operations could ultimately provide energy there? This winter is shaping up uh, with I would say less uncertainty than we saw last winter when the war had just begun. Uh, the Nord Stream pipeline had uh, been attacked and, uh, and taken out of service. And, uh, and Europe didn't have a lot of capacity to import natural gas from other sources other than Russia. Uh, thankfully, uh, industrial demand came off significantly and there was a relatively mild winter which allowed Europe to get through without uh, some of the fears of energy shortages uh, during a very cold winter. This year, natural gas supplies are uh, higher, inventories are higher. There's been some additional import capacity uh, that's been put in place. And I think Europe is in, in a better position in the short term. Uh, I hope that their economy comes back, some of the industrial demand comes back, because that's um, economic activity, those are jobs. And I think it's important for Europe that, that, that we see that continue. Um, and then there's a lot of work underway to bring in uh, energy supplies from other sources to supplement their heavy previous dependence on Russia. And so uh, I feel better about Europe's situation going into this winter than I did the winter before. There are still some needs for investments to uh, secure alternate supplies uh, of energy uh, out through the, the balance of this decade and beyond. Does some of that come from North Africa or will it though? So it will come from yeah. North Africa. Uh, some of it, we hope, will come from the Eastern Mediterranean, where right. we've got a yeah. large gas field in the waters offshore Israel. We've made a discovery offshore Egypt. We've got some other areas that we're, we're hopeful uh, that we'll, we'll make discoveries in. We've got a discovery offshore Cyprus. So there's a lot of gas resource there that is uh, well beyond what's needed for the local economies. And we're working on projects to allow that gas to flow to Europe. That'll right. take a few years for us to get those in place. but. Uh, we certainly uh, believe that will be part of the solution for Europe's diversification. 
In Venezuela, uh, you have a kind of atypical arrangement there in terms of um, getting oil and gas out of that country, oil, I guess, primarily, and the payment structure, what's going on. Can you get us up to speed there? Sure. We've been in Venezuela for the better part of the last hundred years. Uh, this recent period of time has been difficult with sanctions put in place by, uh, by the U.S. And most other Western companies have actually left Venezuela. Uh, we've stayed. We've got a, a, a number of Venezuelan employees, and we're, we're believers in the country. Uh, the rules that had been put in place by the U.S. government have recently been modified, uh, in part to encourage the flow of some of the oil from Venezuela to the U.S., which had been cut off by the previous sanctions. And then the funds from those uh, oil exports uh, can only be used for prescri prescribed purposes uh, and comply with the U.S. sanctions. And so we've had to put in place a financial architecture, I'll call it, uh, to ensure that the cash flows to pay taxes, royalties, uh, legitimate uh, expenses and the like. Uh, and so we've got that in place now and we're seeing that Venezuelan oil come here, which has helped uh, you know, improve U.S. energy security. And they have one of the largest resources on the planet, right? Larger than Saudi Arabia. Yeah, most people don't know that. That's incredible. Um, I want to ask you about uh, something you'd like to talk about, which is, quote, need to balance economic prosperity, energy security, and environmental protection. What does that mean, Mike? Where that has its origins is in the kind of the public debate that I've been engaged in over the last few years, which has really focused so heavily on the environment and climate in particular. When you talk about energy, there's three things that, that really matter. One is affordability. Uh, there are still billions of people on this planet that don't have access to um, clean cooking and heating fuels. Nearly three billion people that use biomass or animal dung for indoor heating and cooking. There's a, nearly a billion people that don't have reliable electricity. So uh, energy needs to be affordable, particularly for those at the, the, the lowest levels of the development process. Uh, the second thing is it needs to be reliable, because without reliable energy, you don't build schools and hospitals and an economy. Uh, so, so energy needs to be affordable, it needs to be reliable, and it needs to be ever cleaner. And we need to balance those three. And if you over-index on any one of those, you can get unintended consequences. Europe over-indexed on climate, and then found out they had supply reliability and affordability issues that really manifested themselves over the, the last year. If all you focus on is affordability, you'll have an environment that nobody wants to live in. And if all you focus on is reliability, you'll have so much redundancy in the system that you can't afford it. So uh, there needs to be a pragmatic and balanced discussion about energy. And the dynamics are different in different countries. There's not one size that fits all. Let me ask you about the environmental uh, aspect specifically. How big a threat is climate change and how is Chevron addressing it? Climate change is real, there's, there's no doubt about it, and uh, our company accepts the findings of the IPCC and are taking steps to, to decarbonize uh, our, our business in a way that uh, helps contribute to the, um, you know, addressing the challenge. It's a big challenge, it's a global issue. So there's no one company, there's no one industry, there's no one country that has all the answers to this. Uh, we want to be a part of that. Uh, how much of a risk it presents is uh, something I'm not really qualified to speak on. We don't do original climate science. We don't do climate modeling. Uh, we defer to others that do that. I'll just say we believe it's a, it's a real issue and it needs to be confronted within the context of also recognizing that affordable and reliable energy allows people to live the lives that they've come to uh, enjoy or those who are on their way, the, the lives that they aspire to. And as uh, nations develop greater wealth and their economies develop, they can also mitigate by building infrastructure, by preparing uh, you know, to, to, to manage risks of all types. And uh, the countries that are most exposed are those that have, have had the least uh, development and just can't afford some of the basic things that we take for granted here. So economic development is at the core of the ability to respond to climate. And how do you respond, just to follow up to that, to environmentalists who would say, either you guys shouldn't be in business on the one hand, or that you're not doing enough. Maybe just focus on the latter group. The, yeah. Those who say you're not doing enough. What do you say to them? I, th there are those who think we're doing too much. Some of our investors would <laughs> yeah. say, we, we'd rather you not do as much as you are. We've committed mm -hmm. to spend $10 billion over just the next few years on hydrogen, renewable fuels, carbon capture, and storage. Uh, for those who say you're not doing enough, 
Throwing more money at technologies that have not yet been proven at scale, that are not cost competitive, doesn't necessarily make them better. It just throws more money at something. And so we need to move rapidly. We need to engage with innovation through uh, universities, national laboratories, uh, startup companies, all of which we work closely with to try to bring these new technologies into the market. Uh, what's different between energy and um, information technology, which has transformed all of our lives, is you're dealing in the physical world with the laws of thermodynamics, physics, and economics. You need to build things, you need to be big things, and it's not just bits and bytes. And so there's a massive investments in infrastructure, trillions of dollars in the existing system that has evolved over 150 years, and it's very difficult to change that as rapidly as, as some people would like. I want to shift gears and ask you about your stock a little bit. Um, it, it's, it's an interesting case study. Over the past five years, you've outperformed. Three years underperformed, one year outperformed, especially over the summer. So, and is this just a reflection of crude prices? And if so, how do you break that cycle and how do you get investors to just hang in there and ride for a long haul? I don't think it's a reflection of crude prices because if that were the case, all the peers who you refer to an mm -hmm. underperform or outperform would tend to ride that same, that same cycle. So. Uh, we're a long, long cycle business, and um, and really long cycle performance is what what matters most. Uh, in the short term, uh, some of our peers have had uh, projects come online; they have had more growth. Some of them had fallen out of favor with investors, and so you can have a starting point issue where a company that had lost uh, its um, support amongst investors changes strategy, modifies some things, and comes back. And so whenever you're doing these point-to-point -point comparisons, it's useful to look at the context. Mm -hmm. uh, we look at all the different periods because we try to judge our performance and perform well in all of those. But longer periods in a long cycle industry tend to be the best indicator of, of real performance. Well, then let me ask you, Mike, what are Chevron's KPIs, key performance indicators? What do you look, what do you benchmark the company by? What do you benchmark yourself by? Sure, so it's very simple. My message to our organization is we need to safely deliver higher returns and lower carbon. Safety is the first word in that statement, and we, we benchmark ruthlessly on safety performance. Everything from slips, trips, and falls to more serious injuries to, to the most tragic of injuries where, where someone can lose their life. It's a, we work in a, in a high-risk environment, and safety and environmental protection matter. So we benchmark on that heavily, and it's the very first thing. Well, the second thing is high return, higher returns. This is an industry that deploys a lot of capital. Over the last decade, it's deployed too much capital and not deployed it efficiently. So we've got to generate returns. Our shareholders expect uh, dividends. They expect a return on their investment. And as an industry and as a company, uh, we, we need to do better. And so it's all the financial metrics. It's free cash flow uh, yield. It's return on capital employed. Uh, and then the third is lower carbon. And we have a whole suite of metrics to both reduce the carbon intensity of the oil and gas and energy products that we deliver to the world today. And we've got a suite of metrics to grow these new businesses that I've mentioned a couple of times already. So mm -hmm. safely deliver, higher returns, lower carbon, the KPIs sit right in those three, three categories. Warren Buffett has bought your stock, he sold your stock. I wonder if you talk to him and if so, what do you guys talk about? I do, I just had lunch uh, with, with Warren uh, a few weeks ago. First thing we talked about was football. He's a big Nebraska football game. I went to the University of Colorado. Well, they, you have an interesting football team this year. We do. And, uh, and we had a big game against Nebraska just uh, a couple of weeks ago, which we had a small, Mr. Buffett and I had a small wager on. Uh, so that was what we began. He's smiling our, with We that. began our discussion uh, yeah. talking about football. Uh, but we talk about, the, uh, we talk about the global economy. We talk about uh, our industry. We talk about our, our company. Uh, he's got a wealth of, uh, obviously, wisdom and perspective uh, from not only the, you know, the investments he's made over years, but the insights he has through all of his companies into various sectors of the economy. And he asks uh, a lot of great questions uh, about our industry. So um, I've been uh, really thrilled to have him as a shareholder and sitting down and uh, you know, having lunch with Warren for two or three hours, is, uh, it's, a, it's a master class in uh, in leadership and uh, in wisdom, and uh, really honored to have that opportunity. And finally, Mike, last question. The Chevron board recently waived the mandatory retirement age um, from 65. For you, you don't turn 65 uh, until um, 
Well, October, you don't, you're turning 63 this October. That's correct. Right? Checking up on you. And you've been CEO for, what, about six years. So it's, it's actually farther down the road than people might think. What are your thoughts about succession and leadership of Chevron? Sure. So, you know, our board uh, wanted to take uh, the, the kind of the, the clock off of that decision for a couple of reasons. One, we've been through this tumultuous period of time that we've talked about. Uh, and, uh, and we've made a lot of progress in terms of performance, but there's more to be done. So they're pleased with the direction of travel, and they would like me to continue to, uh, to drive some of the performance changes that we've been talking about. Uh, you get inside a certain window where you know a CEO is going to leave, and the guessing game begins, right? This kind of takes, the, uh, it takes a little bit of the, the, you know, the, the pressure off of that. And I mentioned it's a long cycle industry. My predecessors, going back several predecessors, have all served for 10 years of roughly a decade, some a little more, some just a little bit less, because you really need to see that kind of time to, to judge somebody in a long cycle business like this. I came into the role a little bit later than my predecessors did and would leave a little bit earlier with that uh, retirement age. And so this just allows us to kind of stay with the pattern that we've historically had. We've got a deep bench of really talented executives. The board will have good choices when, when the time comes for them to uh, identify and, and select a successor to me. And they uh, really just wanted to allow it to happen in a way that's consistent with what our, our past practice has been. Mike Worth, CEO of Chevron, thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome, Andy.